Ghost to Men. So today, the 15th Sunday after Pentecost, we have the story of one of the three raisings from the dead before the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the Gospel. The four cases of raising from the dead, three times in which Christ rose someone else from the dead, and then his own resurrection after three days at the, after his own death. And St. John tells us that there are many more miracles when recorded in sacred scripture in the gospel. So many more that if they were all written down, it would fill more than all the books contained in the world. And so certainly Jesus Christ rose many, many more than three people from the dead. Probably thousands he rose from the dead. But these three are only recorded, and St. John says, and these few are recorded, these few miracles, I guess approximately 26 miracles recorded in the Gospels. These few miracles are recorded for your instruction. Many raisings of the dead. But the second one is the raising of the widow of Naim that is recorded in the Gospel. The first one was the raising of the daughter of Jairus. The second one, the one in the Gospel today, the raising of the widow of Naim. And the third one, the raising of Lazarus. And these are for our instruction. And St. Augustine tells us, they are the raising of a dead soul. They are the raising of a soul that is in the state of sin. And they are the raising of the soul in three different states of sin. In the first state, when the soul is dead only in the mind, that is the sins of the interior, the interior sins, the sins that we commit inside of ourselves without witnesses, even the, the sins against purity, or even though some external sins, but sins which are not known to others, sins that don't have witnesses, these sins are committed, and they, they, we, our soul is dead, and this is the daughter of Jairus. In the case of the daughter of Jairus, she was inside of her house, and our Lord Jesus Christ had to go into the house to raise her from the dead. And this signifies, as St. Augustine as well as others, the interior sins or the hidden sins. But we must also be raised from the dead in our hidden sins. Many people are willing to repent whatever sin they were caught for, but they're not willing to repent for the sins for which they are not caught, or which are interior. And so she had to, he had to go in and raise her from the dead, going inside of the house. The second is the widow of Naim, who is between the house and the cemetery. And she, he is on his way from the house to the cemetery, and the third is Lazarus, who is four days dead in the grave. And therefore, we are at the middle stage of death. At this stage, at St. Augustine, the soul does not know he's dead. He is beginning to commit sins in public. That's why he's outside of the house. Sins are happening on the outside, and he is doing evil things, such as a man who goes with bad companions. St. Jerome says, the widow of Naim's son, he is dead but he does not know he's dead. Why does he not know he's dead? Because he's moving. For we know when we study what life is, life is self-movement. And the boy is moving. He's moving from the house to another place. But it is not him that is moving. It is his four companions that are moving him. And these are the bad companions of the wicked spirits. And the bad companions of souls that he meets in life and surrounds himself with men of wickedness. And then he does evil deeds, and his soul is dead. But he thinks he's alive. He believes that he's alive. And so the son of the widow of Naim is lying dead on the pallet. But he hears noises, says St. Augustine. He says he hears noises, so he must surely be alive. But he does not know that it is not the sound of laughter in the bar. It is the sound of mourners. Remember, in the eastern countries, on the way to the graveyard... The same thing I experienced in India at my first funeral in the village. When I told the people, it is time. I told them, it's time to begin the funeral. I had gotten invested. It's time to begin. As soon as I said it was time to begin, immediately they started weeping. They started weeping out loud. They were waiting for my signal. Is the funeral starting? I said, it is starting. And then they began to weep. Right exactly when I said it was time to begin. For there was weeping on the way to the cemetery in ancient funeral rites. They still do it in India in many places, such as the village where I used to say Mass, in the middle of the country in South India. And they still had this practice in the time of Christ, of course. The weeping, the sounds. We now have a, a vision of a silent funeral march. But in the days of Jesus Christ, it was a loud funeral march. 
If there was a funeral march coming by here, you would hear the women weeping, the paid mourners weeping, the family weeping. There would be loud cries. And you see this still in the Mideast when you see the, the case of the deaths and when men are killed and the tragedies of the Mideast. You, hear, you see at the funerals, you see the men crying, lifting their arms in the air. You see people mourning, not only the women, but the men also. And this is a way in which they visibly express their grief. And St. Jerome says, And this widow of Naim, there are many people crying, but they are the paid mourners. They are not really weeping in their hearts. They don't care. They were paid to mourn, and therefore they mourn. And the young man who is on the tomb, he is laying on the bier, laying on the pallet, being brought to the cemetery, he is dead. But he hears the sounds all around him, I must not be dead. And this is like modern men who are dead. And what do we do as modern men? When we are dead and we know there is no movement inside of our own souls, which is the sign of life, my will is not moving at all. I'm just following my passions. I'm just going whatever way my passion moves me, and this is not life. It isn't life at all. If you kick a rock to the left, it goes to the left. If you kick a rock to the right, it goes to the right. It, does, it moves, but it has no life. And we are like this in our modern times. We move from one bar to another, from one passion to another, from one thing to another, but we are not alive. And being, feeling there is no self-movement, that I am not of my own free will moving myself, but only following my passions, I realize, if I look inside of myself, that I am dead. Therefore, I want to feel alive, and therefore I am moved by the movement of others, and I call that life. And I hear noise, and I call that life, and that is the reason why one of the important elements in our world today is the radio, the Walkman, the TV blasting in the back room. Whenever you're in house, the TV, you're alone in your house, and you have no thoughts of life, and you have no life in you, but you must have the TV on. So you hear voices, you hear noises, and you say, I am alive because I hear noises. And then you hear the people screaming all around you. And you go to a party, you go to, you go to a bar, and the radio is blasting, and all the people are cackling, and you think, I am alive, I am alive, I am alive. This is the thought of the son of the widow of Naim, says St. Jerome, and St. Augustine, in the spiritual sense. He thinks he is alive. Well, where does his life end? The day will come when all those hundreds of people that are with him, his close friends, and they will come to the grave. And remember in the old days, they didn't bury you in a coffin. They kept that for the next person. They will take that pallet upon which you live, and they will dump you in the grave. They will throw dirt upon you, and they will leave, and you will be forgotten forever. And until that day, you feel so alive, and all of a sudden you drop into a pit. And this is the day of the death of the sinner. Some die in the sins of the daughter of Jairus, in their interior sins, and in this way they go to hell. Others die in the sins as they're beginning to live them amongst others, but they're not completely malicious yet. They're not completely malicious. These are the guys that commit sins with their friends, or that are trying to get along, trying to go along with the crowd, trying to get along with the world, and they're doing bad things, or they're going in bad directions, but they're not completely malicious yet. They're not buried in sin. Lazarus will be the symbol of the one who is buried in sin. So buried in sin, that when our Lord Jesus Christ says, roll back the stone, his own sister says, don't roll it back, Lord, he stinketh. The whole world knows he's rotten. In the spiritual sense, of course, Lazarus was a very holy man. But St. Augustine tells us, these three deaths are given to us not only to show the power of God and raising the dead, proving that He is God, but they are also given to us to instruct us about the supernatural life and the three different kinds of supernatural death inside of the soul. And in this second stage, we see the signs of death, but we do not know that we are dead. What happens during the second stage? The widow weeps. Now this is very significant. When we hear the story of the widow of Naim, we think of our modern funeral processions. People walk in silence, 
Everybody's quiet in the church. Everybody's quiet at the funeral, at the, around the casket. And then the mother weeps. And we feel sorry for the mother or the wife that weeps for her husband or the mother that weeps for her son. But in the days of Jesus Christ, the paid mourners were weeping. All the visitors were weeping. Because if you didn't weep, you didn't get the free food that came afterwards. Everybody was weeping. All were weeping. And so when our Lord Jesus Christ walked by, it was noise in that funeral procession. And he paid no attention to the noise. But if you and I walked by, we would not know which one was the mother. There are so many women weeping, so many women weeping, which one is the mother of that son? But when our Lord Jesus Christ walked by, there were so many weeping, so many making noises, but he only noticed one. St. Augustine tells us, notice the things that Jesus Christ did not notice. He did not notice the dead son. He paid no mind to the dead son. For he was already buried in sin, or he was already well on the way to hell. He was already dead, and Jesus Christ paid no mind to him. And here is God, God who became man to save the sinner. And Jesus Christ walks by a dead man, and he pays no mind, and he doesn't care. For there are some sins in which the sinner and not save himself. In fact, all sins are that way. And here St. Augustine tells us, who saves that boy? It is the weeping mother. And the weeping mother is the most powerful of all prayers that can be had, come from a weeping mother. We think of the example, of course, of St. Monica. But the weeping mother that St. Augustine refers to, and he must be thinking of his own mother as well, he says, the mother church. St. Gregory the Great says, the weeping mother. What is the weeping mother? The weeping mother is the men. The men of the church. Remember what our Lord Jesus Christ said, I am your father, I am your mother, I am your sister, I am your brother, I am your mother. Jesus Christ even referred to himself as our mother. And St. Gregory the Great says, the weeping mother are the men of the church. The men who are monks in monasteries, the men that are monks in the desert, the men that are in the cloistered monasteries in the desert doing penance for sins, and also the holy women who are weeping as well. But firstly, the men. And these men weep in the name of the mother, and they weep as a mother when they weep for sins, and St. Gregory says, and they do this especially in the chants of the church. We call the chants after his name. We call it Gregorian chant. He was a great lover of music and the father of our chants, even though, of course, they began well before him. And he says, what is chanting of a monk in a choir stall? What is the chanting of a monk when they used to chant aloud by themselves in the desert? If you went to the fathers of the desert and they were by themselves, they used to pray aloud. So if you walked into a cell, you would hear the monk saying, Lord, Father, you could hear him saying his prayers aloud. Nowadays, if you come in and you see a man talking to a wall, you would say, he's nuts. But they prayed aloud. They sang aloud, even by themselves, very often. For well, what was in the heart always came out of the mouth of the ancient man. You could never keep things fully in his heart. Nowadays we claim we can keep things in our heart and let no one know. But they were more human, more honest in the olden times. And they sang from their hearts. Now in our world today, there are souls going to hell in the most serious manner. All throughout the world, souls are going to hell. And what is their only hope? Our Lady of Quito tells us, in the end of the 20th century, so many souls will be damned. She said that back in 1600, and she showed a vision to Mother Mariana of the 20th century of our times. So many souls will be damned at this time for two reasons. First, because no one will go and save them. That there will be souls who would be ready to receive Christ, and as they walk through the streets and sin, like that son on the way to the cemetery, who's ready to be risen from the dead, even though he's living in sin and on the path to hell, if someone would only weep for him, if someone would only go over and touch his beer, 
touched the pallet upon which he lies, he would rise. But at this time in the history of the church, many souls will be damned because there will be no missionary to touch the beer. The, the beer. There will be no one to weep for them. And therefore, they will go to the cemetery and Jesus Christ will walk by and He will not notice. And they will be damned. And this is one of the mysteries of salvation. Whom does Jesus Christ come to and touch the beer? All of us have been dead on that pallet. Everyone at one time or another in his life has been dead on that pallet. And why is it that some have been risen and others have been not risen? And then Our Lady of Quito says, If in those days the priests and the monks only knew the power of even their weakest prayers. In those days, if even the priests and the monks knew the power of even their weakest prayers. Like the father in the airport. Got to finish briefing before midnight. <laughs> Trying to finish before midnight. One father telling me how he was driving his car. He now died a few years ago. And he was, he was driving his car at night. He realized he hadn't finished his briefing. Pulled over on the side of the interstate. Had no lights, so he knelt in front of the headlights of his car and he was saying the bravery. Police officer pulled over. Police officer walked up to him and he said, What are you doing? He says, I'm reading this book. Just let me, just a minute, just a minute, just a minute. I only got five minutes. And the police officer walked away and said, Boy, that must be a really good book. And he walked away and drove off. The power of even our weakest prayers in this time because, you know, in our times, it's hard to say the rosary. In our times, it's hard to make it to Mass. In our times, it's hard to say a Hail Mary. In our times, it's hard to even say the bravery, which is the most basic duty of the priest. And we often say it in the most distracted manner. But Our Lady listens to these words, like the little mother who receives the drawing, the painting from her little child. Mommy, this is a picture for you, and it is a picture of a brown sky. But maybe the sky is blue if you look outside. It is a picture of an ugly house. It is a picture of a flower which no one has ever seen in since their history in the beginning of mankind. It is an ugly picture. And the, the drawings, the colors are not inside the lines. But the mother takes them, and the mother loves them, and the mother keeps them out of refrains for the next 40 years. And so likewise, in our times, in which we don't have great artists of prayer anymore. We don't have great artists of faith anymore. But even if we pray, even in the weakest manner, in our times, that weak prayer will be taken up, and it will be taken as a weeping. And especially the prayer of the priests, as our leader of Quito says, and the prayer of the monks, and the prayer of the nuns, the prayer of the religious of the church, in the midst of all their weaknesses and all their sins and all their distractions, these prayers will climb to heaven. And the crisis in the church today is that there are not enough of these prayers. As souls are going on the way to the cemetery of damnation, surrounded by more noise than was that young man who had died too young, who was being carried to the cemetery. Now he can go to the cemetery with his iPhone. Now he'd go to the cemetery with his, with his Walkman in his ears. Now he'd go to the cemetery watching pornographic videos on his cell phone. Now he'd go to the cemetery with all his buddies. He can, instead of having to go to the bar to get drunk, he can actually order online. And they'll deliver all the sinful stuff he needs straight to his house. Now the noise is everywhere, even when we're alone. And so, more weeping is required. St. Gregory tells us, Consider our Lord Jesus Christ. It was very similar. Remember when our Lord was surrounded in the crowd. There were people all around him, bumping into him. And he stopped suddenly and he said, Who touched me? And the apostle said, What do you mean, who touched you? Everybody is bumping into you. Everyone. How do we know which one touched you? And he said, I felt power go out from me. And there was a woman in the crowd who touched him, him with his garment. Which even if he was not being bumped, he couldn't have felt it. He was wearing something like our cassock. Even if he wasn't being bumped, he wouldn't have felt it. He said, I felt power come out of me. And she said, Lord, it was I. 
This was the way in which our Lord noticed which one was the mother. All were weeping. All were making noises around that boy that was on his way, the only son of his mother. And he saw and he heard the tears of only one. When Protestants pray, when the enemies of God pray, when those who do not have the faith pray, when they weep like these televangelists, they love weeping. There's even the weeping version of the charismatic movement. When these weep, God does not hear their weeping. Because it is only noise. And it is not coming from faith. And it is not coming from the heart. Those who pray from the heart, God will give them grace. And if they accept it, they will come to the true faith. And if they reject it, they will not. And only God knows who those souls are. But if anyone prays and weeps, and so many pray with great uh, fervor, and so many weep with great conviction, but their weeping and their tears are not heard. We have the example of Antiochus Epiphanes, who is a type of the Antichrist, recorded in the book of Maccabees. You should read the death of Antiochus Epiphanes. He really hated God. He hated the Jews. He set himself up to be worshipped. He was a most wicked and vile man. One of the most wicked men that have ever walked the earth. And there are many wicked men that have walked it. But he became so ill. He became in such agony. And no doctor could begin to cure him. For God himself had punished him with a, with a, with a rotting flesh. He was still alive and he was decaying as dead. And he prayed. You should read the prayer of Antiochus Epiphanes. You would think it was the prayer of a saint. He begged forgiveness. He said he would be good to the Jews. He said he would always be faithful to God. And in this prayer, he died. And the book of Maccabees tells us, Such is the death of wicked men, for God is not likely to hear such prayers. But if you just pulled out that passage, and you didn't read about him before, and you didn't know what was going on in his heart, you would say, My goodness, this man had a holy death. He burns in hell. For those that weep with their tears on the outside, this is not weeping to Jesus Christ. He sees a different kind of weeping. For him, weeping is something different. Only God can recognize which one of those many weeping women is the mother. And he didn't care about the others. He didn't notice the others. He didn't pay attention to the others, including the dead boy. But he paid attention to the mother that wept. Now in this stage of sin, the saints of all of the church tell us, there is a stage of sin where we begin to do wicked things. But we are so much deceiving ourselves that even though we do wicked things, we see ourselves as good. This was the case of the Pharisees. Caiaphas saw himself as doing great good, even though he knew he was doing great evil when he brought about the crucifixion of the creator of the universe and the savior of mankind. He was filled with hate. But he said, I am preserving the law. I am preserving the order. I am not allowing a man who is going to cure on the Sabbath to go about with the people. I am not allowing these people to turn away from us, the true priests of the Old Testament, to something new. He began to be wicked in his behavior. The Pharisees began to be wicked in their behaviors. But they began to blind themselves. And they did not know they were dead. And this is the real tragedy of the son of the widow of Naim, says St. Augustine. He is dead. He does not know he's dead. For if a man is dead and he does not know he's dead, how can he be risen? We are living in sin today. A man says, I am being faithful to my second wife. I used to beat my first wife, but my second one I'm very good to. I am very nice to my girlfriend. I am always a good person. But I don't go to church. I am a good person. I only beat my wife sometimes. I am a good person. 
but I don't follow God. I am a good person, but I don't go to church. And they are really convinced that they're good people. And they do their daily examination of conscience. Bishop Sheen describes the daily examination of conscience. What is it? So a man gets up in the morning and looks in the mirror and decides that I'm still a pretty good guy. That's the daily examination of conscience. I get up and look in the mirror. Yep, still handsome, still smart, still good. And then we go out and examine everyone else's consciences. And we decide that everyone else is bad. And we examine our own consciences and we decide that we are good. And we are beginning to die, or we are already dead, but we don't know it. This is a very serious problem of our times. Bishop Sheen says, it begins to be caused by this error in judgment. The error of judgment is we stop comparing ourselves to God like Job in the scripture reading today in the bravery and we start comparing ourselves to others. The wise men came to Job and they said, look at how you suffer. You were always just. You were always good. You always obeyed God's law. Your wife is dead. You're on boils. You're sitting on a dunghill. You're having one trouble after another. Curse God, curse God, curse God. And this was the advice of his wise advisors. And he had no answer to them because he had no sin upon his own conscience. But he said, though I have no sin upon my own conscience, when I compare my justice with God, I am unjust. When I compare my goodness to God, I am not good. For his goodness is infinite and mine is not worthy to be called goodness when I compare it to him. So spoke Job, who was better than any of us. We make a grave judgment, says Bishop Shane, error in judgment, when we begin to compare ourselves to others, and we stop comparing ourselves to God. And this leads to death in the soul. And we begin, after a while, in the beginning, we are quiet, and we think ourselves better than others. As time progresses, we begin to speak about ourselves as being better than others. And as time progresses, we begin to crush and kill others who are not as holy as us. And this is happening nowadays in the church. It's happening today in tradition. It's happening in our own society. It's happening all over the world. We have a culture in which we are going to stand up for ourselves and we're going to crush and condemn others. Why? Because we are superior beings. Because we are greater creatures. And we don't realize that if we look inside of our own hearts, we may discover that what we think is life is in fact death. What we think is tears is in fact the cackling of paid mourners. And what we think is the path to heaven is in fact the path to the cemetery where we're going to be thrown in and abandoned and forgotten. Therefore, we must look into ourselves. We must look into ourselves. We must stand firm for our holy faith. We must fight for that faith. We must try to spread that faith. But we must recognize that if God has allowed me to receive the gift of faith in these horrible and horrific and perilous times, it is only because of the prayer of some weeping woman whom we will meet on the day of judgment if we are left alive and find ourselves in the grace of God. And we will have to go to that one that saved us and say thank you. What do you think Augustine said on his first day in heaven? He died a great saint, one of the greatest, perhaps the greatest of all the fathers of the church, with a greater charity than John Chrysostom, a greater charity than so many of the other great saints. And those other saints bow before Augustine. But what was the first thing that Augustine did when he went to heaven? He thanked his mother, his holy mother, the Blessed Virgin Mary, and his own physical mother, Monica. For he knew that without these two mothers, and his mother the church, and he knew without these three mothers, he would never have found salvation. He would be damned in hell forever. 
And this is the great custom. If we are allowed to have the faith, if we are allowed to have a rosary in our hand, how many people do not even know what a rosary is? If we are allowed to know that Jesus is God, how many have no idea that He is anything different than Buddha or anyone else? If we are allowed to know these holy and sacred truths, which we do not know by our own reason, we know it by the grace of God. Though reason can give us the motives of credibility and lead us in the direction of faith, they cannot get us to the faith. It is a gift of God. And we must remember in these times, if any of us have the grace of God in us, it is because of some weeping holy mother. And the best way to give gratitude is to weep ourselves. To take our little rosaries, to take our bravery as if we are priests, to take the prayers of the church, to take the things that God has given to us, and weep. Even if the rosary is, you're going to finish it in ten minutes. How oh, grace, You can do the rosary like the children of Fatima. They have their short version of the rosary. <laughs> Hail Mary, Holy Mary. Hail Mary, Holy Mary. Hail Mary, Holy Mary. Now it's time to pray. And what did Our Lady say to them? I am very happy that you pray to me in my honor. She didn't yell at them for not saying the whole Hail Mary and not saying the whole Holy Mary. But I would be so much more pleased if you would say Hail Mary. Full of grace, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou amongst women, and so on. But she even said she was happy with the little Hail Mary, Holy Mary of those little children. And so Our Lady will accept even our weakest and most foolish prayers. And no matter how dark is our life, no matter how deep we find ourselves in sin, let us lift up our weakest prayers to our Lord, and ask the Blessed Virgin Mary to take them, and paint them, and fix them, and repair them, and give them a good shape, and a good name, and bring them to our Lord Jesus Christ, and to God the Father, so that He will accept our prayers, if they are put in the hands of our Mother. And we pray for our Holy Mother, the Church, which is in the most grave time of crisis right now. We pray for our Holy Mother, the Church, that our Holy Mother have more weeping souls, that we have more monks and more nuns and more souls that suffer for Christ and who offer up their suffering for the conversion of sinners and for the salvation of souls. And this is what's going to save our Holy Church and put all their prayers in the hands of our Holy Mother. And then she will come with the power of those prayers, which are nothing, but she will take them as though they are something. And then she shall crush the head of the serpent and bring the great victory. None of us have life except that it comes from without. None of us deserve the faith. And let us not be so proud about our faith. Let us not be so confident that we have it and others don't. But rather let us be grateful and try to live our faith more and more each day and ask that God warn us or protect us from our secret sins. For maybe we also are like that boy, dead, but we don't know we're dead. We, we don't know what is in our hearts. Only God knows. And remember the prayer of St. Joan of Arc. And they tried to trap her. Are you in the state of grace? Are you a friend of God? If she said yes, she was presumptuous. And so they would condemn her. If she said no, she would be admitting that she was in the state of sin. And she would admit that her visions did not come from St. Michael and the, other, and the others that appeared to her. So yes was the wrong answer, and no was the wrong answer, and they were talking to a 19-year-old girl who never learned how to read and had no education. And these wise priests and wise bishops and wise theologians had her trapped. Are you in the state of grace? And she said, if I am, if I, am I pray God keep me there. If I am not, I pray He put me there. And they were silenced. And she was a saint. And if we want to be a saint, let us not think that we are better than that boy. And say the same prayer of, uh, of St. Joan of Arc. O Lord, if I am alive, keep me alive in the state of grace. But if I am not, put me there. In any case, may I always be with you forever. And I am grateful for all those souls whom I do not know now, but I will know in eternity, who have wept for me and wept for my salvation. And let me return a little thanks 
by my own little weeping and my little pathetic way of saying the rosary, my weak way of saying my prayers. And then God will bless us and keep us ready for the kingdom of heaven in these perilous times in which so many are going to hell. Because of that, God bless you all.